Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I hope uh, the travel problems going on in the country today haven't caused you too much trouble so far today. I know we've had our few foibles already this morning. Um, welcome all to this uh, final webinar in 2022 in our private client and entrepreneurial business uh, series. Uh, we will be starting again in the new year. Uh, the first one is scheduled for February, so do look out for those. Um, today we are looking at the benefits of business property relief in tax efficient investing along with pensions. Now I'm joined today as often is the case by my colleague James Kipping who's head of our private client section uh, and also Scott Kent from our financial planning team and just in case you don't know me my name is Patrick King uh, and I'm a head of entrepreneurial business at McIntyre Hudson MHA. So James will start shortly running through pensions from the tax side and then I'll hand and he'll hand over to Scott who will look at investment strategy and lifetime allowances. We'll then move across to the business property relief side, I'll call business relief here, uh, where I will give a brief introduction to what it is, how it works. Um, in the past we've looked at various uses of business property relief in planning scenarios but I don't think we've gone through precisely what it is and how it works in itself. So I'll just run through that quickly before handing over to Scott for the last bit on the use of business relief in investment portfolios. And then if we have any time left, we'll have um, question and answers at the end. Um, please use the uh, Q&A function, which should appear either at the top or the bottom of your screen. It seems to vary. Uh, so if you see the Q&A button, that allows you to ask a question, which we'll try to get to. Uh, and if you could keep microphones turned off during the presentation, otherwise we tend to get a lot of background noise. So I think that brings the introduction to an end. Uh, so I will hand you over now to James to talk about pensions. Thank you, Patrick. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, pensions provide, in my opinion, um, access to one of the most valuable tax reliefs available to individuals. And um, on my way in this morning, I looked up some um, last published statistics and um, HMRC last said when they published these numbers that the income tax and national insurance reliefs um, combined um, are estimated to cost the Treasury in the region of £42.7 billion a year. Now that accounts, interestingly, for more than 10% of all tax reliefs combined. And if you consider there are over 100 tax reliefs in the tax code, you can see how significant pensions tax relief is. Um, therefore, uh, despite restrictions in recent years, which are aimed mainly at higher earners and those with the largest pension funds, the tax reliefs remain generous and we as tax advisors therefore encourage clients to make full use of them um, wherever possible. Now, for the first 10, 12 minutes or so, um, I'll focus on the tax reliefs available for contributing into defined contribution pension schemes. I'm deliberately not um, talking about defined benefit schemes. There simply isn't enough time. Um, um, these defined contribution schemes may be referred to as personal pensions or money purchase schemes. Um, and there are different types of personal pension, including, as listed on the slide here, stakeholder pensions and self-invested personal pensions or SIPs. Now, stakeholder pensions must meet minimum requirements set by the government, including capping charges and the availability of default funds. SIPs, on the other hand, allow individuals to control investments that make up the pension fund and are much more prevalent amongst amongst our client base. There's also the small self-administered scheme or SAS, um, which is a, a type of employer sponsored defined contribution scheme, um, which are usually established for specified directors or senior employees of owner managed businesses. Um, so they are therefore common amongst our owner managed business clients. They provide additional flexibility. For example, and again, as listed here in the third bullet point, a SAS is able to buy a company's trading premises and lease them back to the company. It can lend money back to the company and buy the company's shares potentially. It can also borrow money um, subject to terms and conditions for investment purposes. For example, it might raise a mortgage to help the scheme buy the company's business premises. Um, and I'll come on to an example um, of how a SAS might be useful uh, for an owner managed business um, towards the end of my 10 minutes or so. How are, how are tax reliefs given on contributions? Well, 
Um, they're given slightly differently depending on whether contributions are made personally or by the employer. Now, for personal contributions, the tax relief is given in two ways. Firstly, basic rate tax relief is given at source by the pension fund reclaiming basic rate tax from HMRC as an additional contribution. So a net contribution of, say, £80 is grossed up to £100 by the pension fund reclaiming £20 from HMRC. The basic rate of income tax is, of course, 20%. Higher and additional rate taxpayers can claim a further 20% and 25% respectively by um, self-assessment, that's their tax returns. It's actually possible to get relief at higher rates. And again, I'll come, I'll come to an example where, where it's possible to get tax relief at up to 60% um, in certain circumstances. Um, uh, there are, as I think I alluded to at the start, there are restrictions on the amount of contributions that can benefit from tax relief, either by reference to someone's annual earnings or the pension's annual allowance. And again, I'll cover this briefly um, in a moment. Um, but moving on to employer contributions, these are simply a tax free benefit. So when an employer um, or, or, or your own company makes pension contributions for you, um, they do not suffer income tax or national insurance. And that includes employers national insurance. And actually, the, it's, the, it's the employers national insurance relief that, that accounts for a, a very large percentage of the overall tax relief given on on, on pension contributions um, because it's a tax free benefit employees uh, effectively really uh, receive tax relief at their marginal rate. The relief though is still limited um, by um, the pension annual allowance, um, but crucially also in some cases, there's, there, there's no reference to earnings in determining whether um, uh, contributions are restricted. Um, the employer for employer contributions should also get relief against business profits. Now strictly the contributions need to be wholly and exclusively for the purposes of the business. Um, and therefore they should be commensurate to the role performed by the individual. But in practice, this is rarely a problem and even significant contributions for directors of owner managed businesses can usually be um, defended. I just set out here um, how, um, it's not in, in, in numerical form, how relief on personal contributions works. And um, I'm really setting out the cost um, to the taxpayer um, of a total pension contribution of £10,000. And uh, I'll, I'll look at the left hand column and the right hand column. So, for a basic rate taxpayer on the left, because of the 20% tax relief available, the cost of a £10,000 contribution is £8,000. For an additional rate taxpayer, that's someone paying tax at 45%, the cost um, to them of a £10,000 contribution after claiming all their reliefs is only £5,500. Employer contributions um, are generally more efficient um, because of the relief from NIC. Um, they don't attract um, employers class one NIC, which is at 13.8%, or employees class one NIC at either 12% or 2%, depending upon the level of the individual's earnings. So where employees would ordinarily make contributions personally, it's possible to change the terms of the employment contract so the, the individual sacrifices salary in, in favour of higher in, in employer contributions. Um, this sort of salary sacrifice arrangement is now actually very common um, and our um, human capital advisory team can assist with the implementation of these schemes. Both the employer and employees save NIC um, if this arrangement is put in place. Um, the employer's saving is typically larger um, because we certainly save employers NIC at 13.8%. Um, so quite often we see where these schemes are put in place, the employer and the employee share the benefit with enhanced um, pension contributions by the employer. Other things to note from a tax perspective when it comes to pensions are that income and gains within the pension fund accrue free of tax. Therefore, the gross roll up of investment returns provides a significant benefit or can do um, over a period of time. Members are able to take um, a 25% tax free lump sum when they can access their pension and access is available from age 55 at the moment, rising to 57 in the year 2028. Members may purchase an annuity, but there's no obligation to do so. And instead, the, and, and instead, and actually commonly amongst our client base, the fund can be accessed flexibly, subject to income tax and 
um, on, on pension income drawdown. One thing I've not covered at all here, but I think I probably should raise having just, just thought about it, is um, the inheritability of defined contribution pensions. Um, and the fact they increasingly pay, play a part in a client's inheritance tax planning. So very broadly, if a member dies below age 75, their beneficiaries can inherit their personal pension fund tax free. Whereas if they die from age 75 onwards, um, their beneficiaries will pay income tax at their marginal rate when they choose to draw from the pension. So in either situation, that would normally be seen to be advantageous over um, uh, the fund being charged to inheritance tax, for example. And it's certainly advantageous to the old rule that charged um, um, uh, uncrystallised funds to a 55% tax charge on death. Now, I mentioned, mentioned earlier, there are restrictions to the tax reliefs available on contributions. Now, personal contributions in any given tax year are limited, or rather the tax relievable contributions, are limited to the hire of someone's net relevant earnings, which is basically their earned income, so self-employment or employment income, um, and £3,600 gross. So if you have no net relevant earnings, you can still contribute up to £3,600, uh, including the basic rate tax relief, into your personal pension. Total contributions are also tested against the annual allowance, which has come down significantly over the last going to say 10 years, it's probably it's probably within 10 years. Um, the current annual allowance is £40,000. Um, if that annual allowance is not used, it can be carried forward for up to three years, provided in those years where it's not used, the individual is a member of a registered pension scheme. That's often something we, we people, people, people forget or fall foul of, thinking they can bring forward allowances and use them later, but they need to be a member of a pension scheme in those years to qualify for that carry forward relief. Now, I mentioned that everyone has an annual allowance of £40,000 in any given tax year, but that allowance is then further restricted in certain circumstances. So if an individual has taken flexible lump sums from their pension, um, uh, contributions um, or future contributions are then, then limited um, to £4,000 per annum. Further, um, the annual allowance is reduced by one pound for every two pounds uh, that an individual's adjusted income is above two hundred and forty thousand pounds, assuming they also have threshold income of at least two hundred thousand pounds. Now, adjusted income is basically taxable income plus employers' pension contributions, and threshold income just ignores the employers' pension contributions. So, high earners can be can have their their annual allowance severely restricted. So those with an adjusted income of 312,000 or more in a tax year will have only a 4,000 pounds annual allowance for that tax year. I've put lifetime allowance here on the slide. I'm, I'm simply going to look over that. I know Scott's covering that later on in the, um, the presentation. Now I finish um, my, my 10 minutes or so with, with four examples of where planning can be undertaken with pension contributions. Now, Firstly, the slide here entitled Child's Pension. One thing to consider is contributing to a pension for children. And we see this a lot with grandparents contribution, contributing for their grandchildren up to the maximum of £3,600 per annum. Remember, that's the maximum contribution that can be made for someone who doesn't have any net relevant earnings. This slide shows how the tax relief and compound growth can have such a, such a benefit over time. So, in this situation, I'm saying an individual will make an annual contribution of up to £2,880 into a pension for a child or grandchild. Basic rate tax relief of £720 is added to that, even if that individual hasn't paid any income tax. Make a total contribution of £3,600. If that's done for the first 18 years of, of, of someone's life, um, assuming, of course, they then go into employment or something at age 18, um, and then we we compound that by six, or apply a sort of six percent compound growth. Sorry for the error on the slide. I should say percent rather than th after the six. Um, we have a we have a pension um, fund valued at just over a million pounds at age sixty five. Um, now these figures are purely for illustrative purposes. Obviously, there's time value of money. We might be making contributions after age eighteen, 
But you can see here just the effect of compound growth and contributing to a pension fund early. Further, where where we're this is often something we do as a small bit of inheritance tax planning, um, because you know, if someone is making gifts out of their surplus income, um, they're they're immediately exempt for inheritance tax, and normally this type of contribution would 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 qualify. Um, um, so not only are we getting the the income tax reliefs and the tax free compound growth, but we're 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 removing value from someone's estate at the same time. The second example looks at how it can be possible to receive income tax at up to 60% on pension contributions. So let's say let's say an individual has employment income of 125,000 and no other income. They've already made some pension contributions under under auto enrollment via their employment. So say they've contributed 10,000 pounds already and they come to us and say, well, what further contribution can I make to obtain maximum tax relief? But we know that the personal allowance, that's the tax free personal allowance, um, of 12,570 is reduced by one pound for every two pound that an individual's income exceeds 100,000 pounds. So in the band between 100,000 and just over 125,000, the effective rate of income tax becomes becomes 60%. So the individual's basic rate band is already um, increased um, by 6,250 due to the 5% personal auto enrolment contributions, those contributions already receive tax relief at 60%. But we then advise the individual that if they make a further net contribution of £15,000, which is grossed up to 18750 with the basic rate tax relief, their basic rate tax ban is extended right up to £125,000 and the full additional contribution will receive tax relief at 60%. And the illustration here in the table just shows that the, this means that with this level of tax relief, the total cost of a pension contribution of 18,750 is just 7,500 pounds for someone who happens to be in this situation. And it does happen. We, I've got a couple of clients who are pretty much exactly in this, in this bracket every year. I referred at the start, just two more examples to go. Um, this one, this one uh, uh, relates to uh, an owner managed business with four directors looking to purchase the business premises. They're also 25% shareholders. All are members of a registered pension scheme um, and um, no contributions have been made for many years. Their annual income does not cause an annual allowance restriction. They currently lease their business premises, but the lease is coming to an end and they've got an opportunity to acquire the premises for £800,000. The market rent is about £50,000 and the business has retained profits of £600,000 to assist with the purchase. One director intends to lend the company the balance of £200,000. So a solution could be that the property could be purchased in a SAS. Pension contributions of £150,000 could be made for each director, a total of £600,000 utilising brought forward annual allowances for each individual. Corporation tax relief should be given on the contributions and from April 2023 when the 25% corporation tax rate comes in that would save the company £150,000 in tax. The SAS then borrows £200,000 from uh, the director and the property is purchased. Now the loan has to be on commercial terms, let's say 5% over five years. The company then enters into a lease with the SAS to pay rent of £50,000. This rent gets a deduction for corporation tax um, every year and the SAS doesn't pay tax on the rental income and the rental income should more than cover the interest on the ca and capital on the loan over the five year, five year term. Just one, one idea if a business is looking to acquire their business premises. And the final example before I hand over to Scott is just looking at a situation where um, a business owner can manipulate their taxable income to retain some personal allowance, some uh, um, annual allowance, um, and therefore maximise contrib um, pension contributions. So in this situation, we've got an owner-managed business, single shareholder. They average dividends of 300 k per annum, and the shareholder has has at least 12 k of other income. They therefore have a restricted annual allowance or tapered annual allowance of just four thousand pounds. So they can't make significant pension contributions, but we can better manage income to provide an opportunity for pension contributions. So if no action is taken and they take 
300,000 of income from the company every year. Um, they will always have an annual allowance of pension contributions of 4,000 pounds. And looking over a six year period here, um, 18, uh, 1.8 million of income, but they can only contribute 24,000 pounds into their pension with the benefit of tax relief. If, however, they, they take advice and they're able and they and they and they um, alter the way in which they take dividends. So if, for example, they're able to take dividends of 450K in one year, 150K in the next, and the same again over the next four years, we take the same amount of money out of the company um, by way of their income, obviously as their income, but it preserves the annual allowance um, in, um, in the um, uh, years where the dividend income is only 150,000. The difference here, of course, is that if you look at the right hand column over that six year period, they have been able, if they wish, to contribute 132,000 to their pension as opposed to 24,000 if no action was taken. And on that note, I will hand over to Scott. Thank you, James, and good morning, everyone. So we've covered the considerations of investing into a pension. What investment investment options are available? Well, as James alluded to, we'll only be discussing that for defined contribution pensions, and this is where the value is based on what contributions have been made and what returns have been generated by the underlying assets. UK registered pensions, in theory, can invest into almost any kind of asset, albeit there are some prohibited assets, but providers and scheme trustees may limit the options that are available. So, for an example, a SIP and a SAS, they have greater flexibility than a personal pension plan. So it is key to consider and check what pension you have as to what underlying assets you can hold. But in the main, the main types of asset classes are cash, so fixed um, for you know, deposit accounts or money market instruments, company shares, that's equities, bonds, fixed interest, um, securities, so that could be a government or corporate debt. Commercial property can also be held within a pension, but it is worth noting that residential property is a prohibited asset and the pension could result in a charge of at least 40%. So commercial property is not one that you'd want to consider. Um, so residential property is not one you have to consider. And then lastly, there are other alternatives that can be invested within the pension. So that could be renewable energy, commodities, gold. And I even did come across a SAS that allowed an individual to purchase a classic car within their scheme. So what strategies could we consider? Well, there are a multitude of different strategies which I've listed today. So firstly, you could directly hold a a property in a business premises, as James said, or direct shares, or you may want to consider a collective fund, and that's where your money is pooled together with other investors, and the fund manager will then use that to purchase a variety of different underlying investments. Now, that of course comes at a cost, but there is the additional diversification benefits that may be provided. There's always the argument about whether you go for a passive or active investment strategy, and there are pros and cons for each of those. Multi-asset funds is where the fund manager would effectively invest into different asset classes. So they could be using equities and fixed interest to complement one another during periods of market volatility in order to generate a return to the individual. And if you have a large pension pot or if you are not wanting to make the day-to-day -day decisions you could consider a discretionary investment management service where an investment manager would basically make those decisions on your behalf and they're also risk mapped managed portfolios so it could be a portfolio one to ten based on how much risk you would like to take and then the manager would make those decisions on your behalf lifestyle strategies this is normally where the pension will de-risk the underlying portfolio typically between 10 to 15 years from your selected retirement date. These are very common with workplace pension schemes and what they've been looking to do is reduce the level of risk you are exposed to on the basis that you're looking to use that pot to purchase an annuity in the future. The problem with those is that if you're not looking to draw an annuity and looking to designate it into drawdown, then is that portfolio de-risking itself? 
in your best interest. And lastly, the one I would also like to mention, uh, there are now investment pathways. So the FCA has recently introduced these to allow those in drawdown to match a plan which is linked to what they were looking to do over the next five years. So typically they'll have a plan if you have no intention to touch the pension, if you're looking to purchase annuity, draw on income or take all of the pension pot out as a lump sum, just to ensure that the individual is selecting an investment strategy as upon their review the fca did notice that a lot of unadvised members in pensions were not holding any investments at all and simply leaving it as cash which isn't necessarily the right thing for them so what considerations do we need to um, take into account when looking at what investment strategy is best well first and foremost it's the risk profile and that's not just on how much risk you feel you can take, but also how much you could afford to lose without impacting your standard of living, both now or in the future. Time frame: when do you want to access that pension? And this kind of links in nicely with liquidity. If you feel that you'd like to use your pension savings in five years time, is it really the right thing to then purchase a business premise within that as they are very illiquid? Consideration needs to be taken into account as to when and how you would like to access your pension. Costs, of course, do need to be taken into consideration. The total return on your pension is not just based on the underlying performance of the funds is selected. It's also what costs are being deducted, both from the pension arrangement itself and any advisor or investment management costs. As you'd expect, a discretionary investment management service will cost considerably more compared to a passive index tracker fund. Um, but so it needs to be taken into consideration. And of course, performance needs to be considered as well. How is that investment strategy, that fund performing against its peers and its benchmark? These are the things that we would take into consideration when reviewing a pension and making sure that it's in line, is aligned with what the individual is looking to do. Of course, no guarantee of what future returns may be, but the takeaway really that I would like to give from today's session is that it's really crucial to review your pension investments on a regular basis. At the end of the day, your pension can become your largest pot in order to provide you with an income. So please do check that on a regular basis. Lifetime allowance. We thought we'd discuss this today because this is actually an element that gets um, questioned to us on a frequent basis. Now, the lifetime allowance is the amount of pension benefits that a member can take from a UK registered pension scheme without incurring a tax charge known as the lifetime allowance charge. This has changed since it was established in 2006 and is currently frozen at one million and seventy three thousand one hundred until at least April 2026. So how does it work? Well, a test usually has to be carried out each time benefits are taken from a pension to make sure that the tax charge is applied if the lifetime allowance has been exceeded. Now, these occasions when the test is carried out is called a benefit crystallization event or BCE, and there are currently 13 different BCAs that can be tested. When the pensions are taken and the BCA is um, calculated, the member's lifetime allowance is used up and this is expressed as a percentage and this could therefore leave less lifetime allowance available to the individual when they next look to take some pension benefits. So as an example, if you had £100,000 in a pension and you were looking to access this, then this can use up 9.3% of the current lifetime allowance, thereby resulting in only 90.7% of the lifetime allowance for future reference and of course if the lifetime allowance changes in the future then it'll be 90 percent of whatever that lta is at that point if you have taken all of your lifetime allowance by the use of the pension uh, bces that have already taken place any amount that's over and above the lta is then taxed at a rate of 55 percent if taken as a cash lump sum or 25 percent if it's taken as a pension income. Now, this really needs to be kind of um, taken with, with due care and consideration because the 55% cash lump sum is only if you are taking it as a cash lump sum. 
if you decide to use the excess over and above the lifetime allowance to designate into drawdown, so effectively it's left in the pension to remain invested or for it to be used to purchase an annuity, as an example, then it's 25% that is deducted. But as James said earlier on in the presentation, any income that's drawn thereafter, either from the annuity or from a drawdown pot, is then taxable as income under PAYE. So if you have a higher rate taxpayer, well, if they take it, the excess as a lump sum, they've paid 55%. But if it was £100,000, yes, they designate it into drawdown and pay a lower amount of £25,000. But the 75000 that's then moved into drawdown and then taken out as income would also be taxed and as the 40 rate, 40% 40 taxpayer, that would result in a £55,000 tax liability in total. So it's, it leaves the same position as if you took it out as a cash lump sum. And if you are an additional rate taxpayer, the total tax taken is equivalent to 58.7%. So consideration needs to be taken into account as to what is the best option if you have pensions that are in excess of the lifetime allowance and that the individual is looking to take money from the pension. Whilst we're on the lifetime allowance, I thought I'd just briefly touch on the PCLS, so that's the pension commencement lump sum. As James mentioned, yes, you can take 25% of the pension tax free, but this is actually limited to the lower of the pension value or 25% of the available lifetime allowance. We get asked this question quite frequently, so I thought today I'd just illustrate. So if you have a pension that's £1 million, if you were then to crystallise that pension in order to have 25% paid out as the PCLS tax-free, there's no issues there. You'd have your £250,000 paid out. But in this example below, we have Charlie, who's 65. He has one personal pension valued at £2 million. He's not taken any pension benefits prior to now and has no transitional protection. So he wishes to take his maximum tax-free PCLS during this tax year, let's say to clear off his mortgage, and so asks how much he could draw. The answer is not that he would have £500,000 tax-free cash paid out to him. It is in fact £268,275, as this is 25% of the available lifetime allowance. So again, consideration needs to be taken there. And also the test at 75. So between your normal minimum pension age and 75, when you are taking pension benefits, those benefit crystallization events would occur and the pension administrator will calculate as a percentage how much of your lifetime allowance you have used by taking that pension benefit. It's important to know that at age 75, if the individual has any pensions that are still uncrystallized, so they've not been accessed, they would automatically be tested on their 75th birthday. And the value of the pension on the 75th birthday is what would be used by the pension administrator when calculating how much of the percentage of the LTA um, this would be using. Additionally, any growth achieved on an earlier designated drawdown pension is also tested at 75. So if we go back to an example where an individual at age 70 crystallised their pension and they had £25,000 tax-free paid out to them and the remaining £75,000 put into a drawdown pension. If that drawdown pot grows in value between their 70th birthday and age 75, then that growth is also tested. And that's the calculation that they do. It's just put on the slides. So it's based on the market value at 75 minus the value of the designated drawdown pension at outset. If there is insufficient allowance available, then a lifetime allowance charge will be applied, but this will only be at the rate of 25%. We do get asked frequently if it's going to be 55% and the answer is simply no. And this is because when a lump sum, but when the LTA test is done at 75, there's no physical lump sum that's being paid out. It's simply a calculation by the pension administrator. And because there is that no physical lump sum payment, only the 25% charge would be levied 
on the excess. So what can you do? Well, there are a few considerations that can be decided when looking at someone's lifetime allowance position. Because there have been quite a few changes over the years on the lifetime allowance value, so it was at 1.1.8 million pounds, and that then fell to 1 million from April 20, 2016. There are certain protections that you can apply for. Now, I won't cover the ones that have previously been in existence, but the two that you can still apply for today is individual protection 2016 and fixed protection 2016. So with the first, if you had pensions value, and that's all of your pensions, not just one particular part, it's all of your pensions combined together. If they were valued at over £1 million as at the 5th of April 2016, then the individual could apply to HMRC to have their own personal lifetime allowance equivalent to the value as of that date capped at 1.25 million. So is, as an example, if they had 1.2 million pounds as of the 5th of April 2016, that could be their own personal lifetime allowance for which any BC would then be tested against. With this option, you are allowed to continue to fund and contribute into your pensions. So there's no issue there. The other available protection is fixed protection 2016. Again, it's dependent on the value of your pensions at the time as of the 5th of April 2016. But with this one, whilst it would increase the individual's lifetime allowance to 1.25 million, no further pension contributions to a DC scheme can have been made from the 6th of April and for any defined benefits that an individual has, the accrual has to be limited to CPI. If the individual, as an example, went into a new employer and they enrolled them onto the workplace scheme automatically, that would annul Fixed Protection 2016. So the considerations is have a look at the pensions, see what they were valued at as of the 5th of April 2016, and see whether or not you can apply online via HMRC's Government Gateway to have that applied for. There's an argument that if you have fixed protection 2016, you should also apply for individual protection 2016, just in case the fixed protection 16 is removed. Other options can include stop funding contributions to potentially reduce the growth, review the underlying investment strategies. If you've got other investments, do you want to have your more higher risk equity portfolio in an ISA, for example, and hold a more cautious stance within the pension, again, to potentially limit the growth that's been attained. You could look to phase access on how you take your pension benefits. You know, we're only looking at the legislation to date that could always change in the future. So if the lifetime allowance were to increase and you've used 100% of your lifetime allowance, then you wouldn't benefit from any future increases. If you phased and took your pension benefits over time, you'd only be using the percentage of the lifetime allowance at each point. Um, scheme pensions is something that could potentially be considered if you had a small self-administered scheme, but I won't quite cover on that one today. Um, small pots rules as well could be considered. So you have got the ability to take um, pension benefits from a, from a personal pension that's worth less than £10,000 without leading rise to a lifetime allowance charge. So it is a consideration to move some of the pensions into others and have them at less than 10,000 and make use of the small pots rules. But lastly, there is the potential just to leave the pension to remain invested and grow over time, simply because, as James has alluded to, pensions are very tax advantageous and they are outside of your estate currently for inheritance tax purposes. Yes, there is a lifetime allowance charge and let's say it was at the 25% rate, but surely 75% of something is better than 100% of nothing. So those are the considerations that you could take into account. And I'll pass you to Patrick. Thanks, Scott. Um, we are just slightly behind schedule, so I'll try to be fairly quick here. And as you can see, we're now moving away from pensions and towards business relief. So uh, if I can go to my agenda slide, uh, I'll, I'll cover briefly what business property relief is, what qualifies, what we mean when we say wholly or mainly, what are accepted assets, and a couple of things you have to consider leading up to and post sale of a business. 
<clears throat> so in essence, business property relief is a relief from inheritance tax, either at 100% or 50%. And you get those reliefs if you own a qualifying asset and you've owned that qualifying asset for at least two years at the date of death or gift. So what assets qualify? You can have the next slide, thank you. Um, well, you'll get 100% relief if you own a business or an interest in a business. And when I say interest in a business, that's effectively covering the situation where you might have a partnership share uh, rather than just owning a business as a sole trade. You also get 100% if you own shares in an unlisted company. 50% uh, relief is available where you own shares in a quoted company, but you only get that relief if you own enough shares to give you more than 50% votes, i.e. control of that listed company. Uh, so it's relatively rare, but it, it can happen. You can also get 50% relief if you own land and buildings or land or buildings um, which are used in your business or in the partnership that you're a partner of. Uh, you can also get it in situations where the land or buildings is owned in a trust that a business is entitled to use and users in its business. So they're the areas where you can get 100 or 50 percent relief. Uh, needless to say, as this is a very valuable relief, uh, it's not quite as simple as that. So not all businesses qualify. And I'm using the word business uh, mainly because the legislation uses the word business. But business is wider than trade. But when you're looking at business property relief, uh, it's pretty close to talking about trading versus non-trading. So there are certain businesses which do not qualify. So if your business or the business of your company is mainly dealing with securities, stocks and shares, or dealing in land or buildings, or in the making or holding of investments, then that business will not qualify and that, and that will not get uh, the business property relief. If your business is a not-for-profit organisation, it doesn't qualify. If you have a business that would otherwise qualify, but you've arranged to sell it, but you may not have sold it yet, but it's in the process of being sold, then it will not qualify. So dying just before you've sold, but after you've agreed to sell is not a good, good idea. Equally, if you're winding your business up uh, and you manage to die before it's finalised, again, that will not qualify. In both the business being sold and the, wind, and the winding up state, if the process of being sold or being wound up is to result in you continuing to own or the business continuing in some form, uh, and in the case of a sale, you receive shares in the buying business, then it's possible relief could still continue. But normally in those circumstances, it will come to an end. Uh, next one, please. So wholly or mainly, in order to qualify for the business property reliefs, you have to show your carrying on a qualifying business and you have to be doing that wholly or mainly. But what does wholly or mainly mean? Well, for this purpose, it has been defined over many years in, in court cases at more than 50 percent taken in the round. So if you have a business that is 51 percent or more trading compared to non-trading broadly or 51 percent uh, qualifying business to be more accurate, then that business can qualify for business property relief. Uh, when looking at in the round, we mean you don't just look at the value of assets, for instance, that are on the business side compared to assets on the non-business side. Uh, you look at everything. So you'd consider turnover. To what extent does turnover relate to the qualifying assets and the unqualifying assets? You'd look at profit in the same way. You'd look at the value of the assets you're using in the two different parts of the overall business and also activity. So how many employees uh, are used in one business, one part of the business compared to the other? How much of your time is used in one part of the business compared to the other? And when comparing all that together, you come up to a conclusion as to whether or not you're more than 50 percent trading. Now, needless to say, there are areas of doubt here. But uh, that gives you the broad picture. If you're mainly trading, you're probably or mainly carrying on a qualifying business, which for the purposes of ease is largely trading as opposed to not trading, then uh, you will potentially qualify for business property relief. There are some quirks, though. Um, if I just cover this first bullet point first, a, a company or a business can carry on a trade, uh, but also have 
non-qualifying activities. Provided those non-qualifying activities are less than 50%, as I alluded to in the last slide, then the business can qualify for business property relief. But there is an issue when it comes to uh, companies in particular. So we can just quickly nip to the next slide, James, and I will hop back in a moment. So accepted assets. An accepted asset is an asset that is not used wholly or mainly for the purpose of the business in the two years before death, death or gift, and is not required for the future use of the business. And the most common one is surplus cash. But there are uh, some quite uh, tight rules on what we mean by surplus cash. Uh, case law has, for instance, suggested that having more than you need for the day to day running of the business as defined, and that will vary depending on from business to business. So, again, there is room for manoeuvre here. But if the business owner is a cautious person and decides they'll keep a reserve for uh, a dark days or bad times, uh, a strategic reserve, if you like, because that's not earmarked for anything in particular, that is likely to be regarded by HMRC as uh, surplus cash and therefore an accepted asset. And accepted assets do not qualify for business property relief. So to the extent the value of your shares or your business is reflected in the accepted assets, you don't get the business property relief. So care is clearly needed when building up cash reserves in a company, which you might be tempted to do because if you take the money out, you have to pay tax on it after all. Um, we would quite commonly give people the advice to leave money in if they didn't need it. When the cash starts getting to that point where it's more than they require and they haven't got some specific reason for keeping it, uh, if, for instance, you want the money because you're looking to buy another business or you're looking to buy a, a property, say, or some expensive machinery, then you could probably justify keeping more than the normal cash and the revenue would probably accept that, provided it was a clear plan and a clear earmarking of those funds. Otherwise, it's going to be too much. And we would suggest considering whether or not money is withdrawn to avoid a potential business property relief uh, problem. If we can just go back to the last slide briefly. Where you have a group of companies, you need to be fairly careful because the shares you will own as the owner of those shares, the owner of that group will be in the holding company. And to assess whether those shares qualify for business property relief, you look at the group as a whole and apply that 50% uh, test. So is it more than 50% acting in qualified businesses or trading activities? If the answer is yes, then the starting point is your shares will qualify for business property relief. If you then, you then have to carry out a second test though and look at each individual company within the group. And if one of the companies, for instance, is perhaps mainly an investment business, then that company itself will not qualify. And that company in this circumstance is regarded as an accepted asset and its value will not therefore obtain business property relief. So one of the planning tips we look at in this area is whether or not it's worth moving investment assets up to the holding company such that you can show that overall that company is trading and uh, the investment assets can potentially qualify. Uh, the, the relevance here is if you have a single company that is, say, 52% trading and 48% carrying on an investment business, the whole value of that company potentially qualifies for 100% business property relief. If instead of it being one single company, the investment part was in a subsidiary, then that bit may well not qualify. And so you can see it's a bit of a quirk there as to how it works. We can skip forward two slides, James. Thank you. Losing business property relief. Well, if the business uh, or a company which qualifies for business property relief is sold, then quite clearly you no longer qualify for business property relief. It's not quite as simple as that, though. If you have agreed to sale but die before it goes through, uh, that sale in theory might not even happen. But business property relief is lost because you had a contract to sale at the date of death. And I've already mentioned the winding up situation as well. If you're winding it up uh, uh, and then you manage to die before the winding up is completed, again, no business property relief is available. So let's consider a very simple example. Mr. A sells his family company for five million pounds. Now, immediately before that sale, before he's contracted to sell, uh, if he were to die, in theory, there'd be no inheritance tax on that value because of business property relief. After the sale, 
more accurately contract him to sell, that £5 million no longer qualifies. And so if he then dies, uh, he will have a tax bill, if nothing else is done, of up to £2 million. So what I'm saying here is, when looking to sell your business, part of the overall planning ought to include how it impacts your inheritance tax position and what you might want to do about it, including further investments, possibly into business assets and possibly uh, investments into uh, structured investments. And that neatly leads me on to hand you over to Scott for the final part of this, looking at uh, business property relief in inheritance tax planning. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. So yes, so having covered off what business relief is, why and how can you use this to mitigate inheritance tax? Well, let's start firstly by briefly running through the estate plan options that are available. So if you notice that there is an inheritance tax liability, well, first and foremost, you can spend it. If it's not there on death, then it won't be calculated and included in the inheritance tax calculations. You can, of course, gift it. So whether that's into whether that's to an individual, so it'd be a potentially exempt transfer or into a trust, which is a chargeable lifetime transfer. In most instances, you'd have to survive seven years from the date of that gift for it to fall outside of your estate. Similarly, you could gift to charity as well. But with those options, that would mean that the money is no longer held in your name. Life cover can be included, so you could set up a whole of life insurance policy with the view that the sum assured would pay out into a trust, and this is then used to pay for the inheritance tax liability. And as discussed earlier today, pensions are fantastic in the sense that at the moment they and currently under legislation, they are exempt from any inheritance tax calculations. So where would business really fall into this? Well, a lot of the conversations that we have is that with gifting either into trusts or to potential beneficiaries, the individuals may not be ready to have that gift. They may not feel that they can survive seven years from the gift being made, and they may want that money for future reference. And care fee planning is a large concern for many. Yes, we are all living longer but we're living longer with ailments. So do you want to gift a hundred, two hundred thousand pounds outside of your out of your estate to your family when you may need that in the future? And if you ask for it, they may not be able to give that back to you. So how can business relief work? Well, there are, as Patrick has said, you know, the underlying investments that can now be made, whereby if you have held that investment for two years from the date of the investment being made and it's still held on death, that can qualify for business relief. And there are two main options that I will consider today. A lot of these are known as estate planning services or inheritance tax service. But as an example, if you were to invest £100,000 of your capital into one of these qualifying investments, then after just two years, that could save £40,000 in inheritance tax. But just as importantly, the investor retains access and control of that. And that's where it can differ from gifting. You don't have to wait seven years, it's only two, and you still have access to this. Full and partial withdrawals can be requested, and normally it can take two weeks for that to be paid from the provider. But please be aware, the types of investments that are being made, there's always the chance that liquidity may not be available. So that is, of course, one of the risks being taken. And it's important to note that the test for business relief is on death of the investor. So when the claim is put through to HMRC, that is when they will look to see whether the underlying investment has qualified for business relief. So what types of investments could be select? So there's two options, really. One is that you could purchase a portfolio of AIM listed companies. So AIM is the alternative investment market, and that has been quoted to be the world's most successful market for fast growing smaller companies. And there are hundreds of companies listed onto the AIM market. So rather than just investing into any, typically the underlying provider would have an investment team that would manage a discretionary portfolio 
of a listed companies on behalf of the investor. So you wouldn't be making those decisions yourself. It would be a investment management team that does this for you. And typically they hold in the region of 20 to 40 underlying companies. And that's to ensure that the underlying companies are qualifying for business relief purposes. From 2013, the government have allowed AIM portfolios to be held within a stocks and shares ISA. So if an individual has a cash ISA or stocks and shares ISA, they're not needing to access and they have an inheritance tax liability. One consideration could be to move that into an AIM portfolio and hopefully qualify for business relief after just two years. The main consideration with the um, AIM listed companies option is as shown and illustrated in the graph below, AIM is quite volatile and is typically more volatile than the main market, such as the FTSE 100 or S&P 500. So whilst you do have the ability to potentially generate some growth on that value, it could fall in value as well. So consideration really needs to be taken into account into the risk profile of the investor. And equally, there's also unquoted companies, and these are more of your estate planning services. So here, the investor would purchase shares in an unquoted company, and that unquoted company would then undertake a variety of different underlying trades to allow for diversity and to generate different income streams for the investors. And some of these examples can include renewable energies, so a wind farm, solar farm, healthcare, construction, financing, leasing. So there are some providers out there that will, for example, build an ambulance and lease it to an NHS trust for 10, 15 years, self-storage and even fibre optics. These investments can be less correlated to mainstream equity markets and the providers say that they are targeting capital preservation. So not looking to generate five, six, seven percent per annum returns. They're simply looking to maintain the real value over the term of that investment because their main target is qualifying for business relief. Because it's an unquoted investment, of course, liquidity is one of the main issues. So they're still deemed to be higher risk than a standard portfolio. But where you've got an individual who necessarily doesn't want to do any gifting, doesn't want to pre-fund their inheritance tax liability via the use of a whole of life policy, business relief investments can be a really suitable arrangement and it can complement any investment strategies as well because it's an additional diversifier from other investments that they may have. With this and with the lifetime allowance, I really must stress, you know, advice does really need to be taken. There are a lot of considerations and um, you could fall foul of some of the rules. So definitely worth speaking to a financial advisor in either of those instances. Thank you, Scott. Um, as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, we've pretty much used up our allotted hour um, as we still have a fair number of people on. Um, I'm going to just add on a couple of minutes for a couple of questions, if that's OK. Obviously, if people have to go, then then please feel free to do so. Uh, do we have uh, any questions, Kat, um, from the from the audience? Uh, yes, I've just I have just answered it because I wasn't sure if we'd have time, but we've had a question going right back to the pension section at the beginning asking about the annual allowance and if it includes the basic rate tax relief. So yes, the £40,000. Yes, yeah, it does. Yes, sir. All I can say really it's the great, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a net contribution. So what is it? 32000 plus the £8,000 basic rate tax relief. Yeah. And it covers, um, includes employer contributions as well, I've said. Yes, that's right. That's right. So if it was employer contribution, they could contribute the full 40,000 because there'd be no additional basic rate relief given um, into the pension. Were there any more questions or is, is that it today? There's a question about, uh, I think there was an error on one of the slides um, and they asked if that was going to be amended on the handout. Yes, we'll we'll make sure we we cover that. Uh, I did did notice as we were going through one or two uh, minor quirks. So yes, we'll try to amend those. So sorry about that. Um, I think as we have gone over time, we should probably bring it to an end now. Uh, but thank you again all for attending uh, and look out for us uh, our continuing series in the new year starting in February. Uh, we look forward to welcoming some of you to those again. Thank you. <laughs>